wonderful to be here, brethren, for all of us together on this holy convocation, which we know is called the Feast of Trumpets, and uh, which is described in our booklet, the book, the flagship booklet. We have God's Holy Day Plan, the Promise of Hope for All Mankind, as a chapter on the Feast of Trumpets. And the title of that chapter is The Feast of Trumpets, A Turning Point in History. And it states uh, that this feast day, and to quote what it says, depicts nothing less than the return of Jesus Christ to earth to establish the kingdom of God, which is saying a lot to try to absorb what all that means. That is nothing less than that is what we are here celebrating. So a few highlights I gleaned from this uh, chapter from the Future Trumpets in this booklet. The initial instructions for keeping this feast uh, are mentioned in Leviticus 23, verses 23 through 25. Leviticus, uh, speaking, thank you. Uh, Leviticus 23, uh, starting in verse 23. Then the Lord or the Eternal spoke to Moses, saying, Speak to the children of Israel, saying, In the seventh month, on the first day of the month, you shall have a Sabbath rest, a memorial of blowing of trumpets, a holy convocation. You shall do no customary work on it, and you shall offer an offering made by fire to the Lord. And of course, we just offered an offering to God with our, uh, with our holy day offering we just did. Trumpet blasts in the time of ancient Israel were used for two general um, general uh, purposes. One was to communicate important messages. Those messages could be gathering the people together, uh, the people of Israel together. And they could, uh, in fact, uh, God did it. Uh, before giving the uh, Ten Commandments on Mount Sinai. Trumpet blasts, supernatural trumpet blasts, occurred to, to gather the people, to draw their attention. Uh, and trumpets also uh, added, and they furnished a festive, joyous sound for those celebrating the Feast of Trumpets in ancient Israel. And of course, uh, uh, the, other, the other message that the Feast of Trumpets had or gave was of impending danger or impending war. And that can be found by uh, in, in Numbers chapter 10. Uh, you can refer to that and read that in more detail. The New Testament reveals prophetic significance to the blowing of trumpets. And so, if we could jump to 1 Thessalonians 4, 16 through 18. It's interesting. This feast of trumpets is the only one of God's annual holy days that is not specifically mentioned in the New Testament. <clears throat> However, in one sense, it's probably, it's indirectly mentioned, uh, let's say, possibly, uh, uh, I don't know if we could say more, but it's extensively saturating the New Testament. Uh, to give us understanding about the, the Feast of Trumpets. So now in 1 Thessalonians 4, starting in verse 16, it says, 
for the Lord himself will come down from heaven. That's Jesus Christ. He promised he would. With a loud command, with the voice of, of the archangel, and with the trumpet call of God. Now, I'm not sure uh, whether Christ will have an angel blow that trumpet or whether he will blow that trumpet. If anyone has any thoughts on that, afterwards we can talk about it. But one way or the other, it's going to be by the will of Christ that this trumpet blast occur. And the dead in Christ will rise first. And brethren, we have been blessed to be potential people to fit that category of, well, of either being the dead in Christ, those who have died before Christ's return, or to be those who are allowed to physically live all the way until Christ returns and be changed. And so uh, at, at his return. So do we read that? The trumpet uh, uh, call with the trumpet call of God and the dead in Christ will rise first. After that, we who are still alive and are left will be caught up together with them in the clouds and the atmosphere, the air, atmosphere of this earth to meet the Lord in the air, it says, and so we will be with the Lord forever. So we want to be where he is. And he says it's going to be rain on earth. So that's where we want to be with him on the earth. And so we will be with the Lord for encourage one another with these words. So the feast of trumpets was meant to be of great encouragement to us. And to be a feast like all the other feasts, a, a great day of rejoicing. In uh, 1 Corinthians 15, uh, which I'm just going to read verses 51 through 54 and 57. The Apostle Paul wrote this also. He said, Behold, I tell you a mystery. We shall not all sleep, but we shall all be changed in a moment, in the twinkling of an eye, at the last trumpet, which we know to be the seventh trumpet, which we'll get to. For the trumpet will sound, and the dead will be raised incorruptible, and we shall be changed. For this corruptible must put on incorruption, and this mortal must put on immortality. So when this corruptible has put on incorruption and this mortal has put on immortality, then shall be brought to pass the saying that is written, death is swallowed up in victory. And then jumping to verse 57, but thanks be to God who gives us the victory through our Lord Jesus Christ. And one more, one more First, I'd like to cite here, this time from the Apostle John. And it's associated with the blowing of a trumpet when Christ returns. And that's in Revelation chapter 11 and verse 15. Revelation 11, 15. And it says, then the seventh angel sounded, and there were loud voices in heaven saying, The kingdoms of this world have become the kingdoms of our Lord, and it is Christ, and he shall reign forever and ever. So these passages that I've just read to you dramatically attest to the significance meaning of this Feast of Trumpets. And also in that chapter, uh, a point, a highlighted point from that chapter in the booklet on the Holy Day, our, our booklet on the Holy Days, God reveals additional details 
about his plan of salvation to those who keep his annual feast days. Mr. Armstrong saw that he was uh, commanded to keep the holy days, the annual holy days. And when he started keeping it, I believe it was for seven years, but it was, yeah, it was seven years. He kept it without understanding why he was doing it. And then all of a sudden, God started to open his mind. And he does that to us as we follow the example that Mr. Armstrong said in that regard. And so each of the feast of days that we keep revealed different aspects about the plan, the master plan God has for us humans. And, and of course, the Feast of Trumpets, uh, we get additional details by keeping the Feast of Trumpets from various scriptures in both the New Testament and the Old Testament. And if specifically, specifically the book of Revelation reveals the prophetic sequence of end time events leading up to Christ's return, including it specifically mentions seven trumpets. So that's how we know that the Feast of Trumpets is not just one trumpet, but it's seven trumpets that we are to commemorate and remind ourselves of. So today, the purpose of this message is to give uh, a brief overview of where we are now in, end to, in the end time sequence of events that are prophesied. I wanted to be brief so that I won't take, I will allow you time for your lunch. Uh, anyway, um, so, so to describe uh, uh, this, the sequence of events prophesied within what is called in our uh, in our booklet, uh, the Book of Revelation unveiled. Um, there is a inset called the story flow of the Book of Revelation, and. Um, which describes there being, now what it does describe in that story flow, brethren, is and I, 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 to tell reality uh, an increase in human suffering at these end times as we approach the return of Christ. I think we all sense that there is more sobering suffering going on in the world at large and from prayer requests and sharing experiences of fellow brethren. And um, I think we can say that trials and suffering is increasing as we approach the second coming of Jesus Christ of human suffering. spiritual and physical. 
that all the healings that we read about in the four Gospels are only a small foretaste, just a small sample of the powerful, massive healings that will yet occur, will be performed by Jesus Christ when he comes back with all power to do that. So now, uh, I think if we can have just the first slide, PowerPoint, if that's possible, slide one. Um, this slide is taken from another booklet we have, which I tried to find. It's buried somewhere in my room, but it's called The Rapture versus the Bible. It's a small booklet that was produced in conjunction with the Beyond Today telecast. And actually there's two telecasts on the rapture. I just don't, I realized last night. But there's an inset in there. You can look this up uh, as an infographic. Uh, it's called an infographic drawing that the church produced for that booklet. And um, I'm not asking you to read this fine print, but I'll, all I want to do, and I have this uh, slide here. And I realize, anyway, all this is, is, is titled Progression of End Time Events. So basically, it summarizes key story flow of the book of Revelation. And if you this if you represent that as a timeline, and I'm going to show you another uh, other slides that will be more easy to read. But all I'll just say briefly: there are four seals. There are a total of seven seals in the Book of Revelation that are mentioned. Uh, there's the first four seals, a fifth seal, a sixth seal. And the seventh seal, which consists of the seven trumpets. That uh, I will read those, the prophecies about those seven trumpets. And the seventh trumpet is actually unleashes the seven last plagues. So it's very interesting construction. So as you said, this booklet, um, info, uh, infographic, seven seals, seven trumpets, seven last plates. Now for the next slide, slide please. To go in, and since I'm focusing on the trumpets, I will just summarize the first four seals. How do we understand what the meanings of the symbols in the book of Revelation are. So who inspired the book of Revelation? God the Father gave this scroll to Jesus Christ, who was authorized to open and reveal this to mankind. And so when he uh, so we can look to him in the end time prophecies called the Olivet Prophecies right before Christ uh, end of his ministry when he expanded more about those symbols of the seals and the trumpets etc that are in the book of Revelation so so the first seal see I'm, I'm not expecting you to read it but it's religious deception. Maybe you can sometime. And that's found in, in Revelation chapter 6, verses 1 through 2. And so um, I'm not going to read that because I want to have time to focus on the seven trumpets. trumpets. But Revelation 6, 1 through 2, talks about the first seal 
And Christ expanded on that in Matthew 24, verses 4, 5, 11, and 23 through 25. It's in the it's in our booklet, and um, I'd be glad to give you my notes if you would like. Uh, and uh, that's the first seal, religious deception. So what did Paul say just a short time after the church started? He said, man, there's false teachers already creeping into the church. And, uh, and if you go on YouTube, if you try to believe everything that you see, you will be in sad shape because there is so much religious deception and chaos in this world today. Then Christ said, and what happens after religious deception? A natural out fallout of religious deception, and they seem to go hand in hand, is war. War and rumors of war. So that is the next seal, Revelation 6, 3 through 4. And Christ paralleled that in Matthew 24, verses 6 and 7. Wars and rumors of wars. Then, what happens after warfare? In many cases, it leads to famine and food shortages. And that is the third seal that Christ said. And that's in Revelation 6, 5 through 6. Also, in Matthew 24, 7. And finally, after that, the natural fallout, first three seals, and the famine, and the third seal is disease epidemics and earthquakes, and, and also earthquakes. And that's in Revelation 6, 7 through 8. And also in that Matthew 24, verse 7. And then... It says, so brethren, this has been happening and, and intensifying, generally speaking. There's been ups and downs, but it's been on an upward, upward track for 2,000 years. But then Matthew 24, 8 says something. It says... All these, in other words, those first four seals that I just mentioned, are the beginning of sorrows. And then the fifth seal is tribulation and persecution, religious persecution and tribulation. That's in Revelation 6, 9 through 11. And that's stated in Matthew 24 verses 8 through 12 and 21 through 22. And finally, this, not finally, but next to the last, is the sixth seal, which is heavenly signs. There are going to be things displayed from the heavens that show that this is a very unusual, unique um, momentous time, a, a time, very, uh, a turning point of, in human history. Then comes the seventh seal. And I'm just going to go through the seven trumpets. So all these things I've just mentioned that have been intensifying. And then after all that, it, it starts with the first trumpet. And what is the first trumpet? Trumpet one, destruction of vegetation. Revelation 8, 7. So I'm going to go to and start reading these from the book of Revelation. And Revelation 8, verse 7. It says, the first angel sounded, in other words, sounded, that angel sounded his trumpet, 
and hail uh, and fire followed, mingled with blood, and they were thrown on the earth, and a third of the trees were burned up, and all green grass was burned up. I'm describing things that are really indescribable and incomprehensible, that are totally beyond anything uh, we have any frame of reference to understand to have seen uh, or comprehend. But that is the first trumpet. The second trumpet is devastation of ocean and sea life in Revelation 8, 8 through 9. Then the second angel sounded and something like a great mountain burning with fire was thrown into the sea and a third of the sea became blood. And a third of the river creatures in the sea died, and a third of the ships were destroyed. Cataclysm, cataclysm. And that's trumpet two. Trumpet three. Devastation of rivers and fresh water. So that be, it's interesting. Some of this parallels some of the things that happened uh, to ancient Israel when they were exiting, exodusing from Egypt. But anyway, there's some similarities. So that one, that trumpet is devastation. The third one, devastation of rivers and fresh water. Revelation 8, 8 through 11. Then the third angel sounded and a great star fell from heaven, burning like a torch. And it fell on a third of the rivers and on the springs of water. The name of the star is Wormwood. Wormwood, a third of the waters became Wormwood. And many men died from the water because it was made bitter. The fourth trumpet. The sun, moon, and stars were darkened. Revelation 8, 12. Then the fourth angel sounded, and a third of the sun was struck, a third of the moon, and a third of the stars, so that a third of them were darkened. A third of the day did not shine, and likewise the night. Totally unprecedented. Then the next slide, please. Number five, torturous human affliction. Human suffering and misery, as I said, is going to increase up until the return of Jesus Christ. Now read this. I'll read through this Revelation, and you can read through this. Revelation 9, 1 through 12. Then the fifth angel sounded, and I saw a star fall from heaven to the earth. To him was given the key to the bottomless pit, or the very deep abyss, is a better translation. And he opened that uh, abyss, and smoke arose out of the pit like the smoke of a great furnace. So the sun and the the air were darkened because of the smoke of the pit. Then out of the smoke, locusts came upon the earth. And to them was given power as the scorpions of the earth have power. They were commanded not to harm the grass of the earth that was left um, or any green thing or any tree, but only those men who do not have the seal of God on their foreheads. And they were not and, and they were not given authority to kill them, but to torment them for five months. This particular affliction will be for five months. Their torment is like the torment of a scorpion when it strikes a man. In those days, men will seek death and will not find it. They will desire to die, and death will flee from them. The shape of the locust was like horses prepared for battle, probably describing modern weapons. On their heads were crowns of something like gold and their faces were like faces of men. And they had hair like women's hair and their teeth were like lion's teeth. And they had breastplates like breastplates of iron and sound. And the sound of their wings was like the sound of chariots with many horses running into battle. He didn't have any words in his vocabulary, John didn't have the words to describe it and had to use 
the best he could to describe it. They had tails like scorpions. There were stings in their tails. Their power was to hurt men five months. And they had it like, as king over them, the angel of the bottomless pit, or great abyss, whose name in Hebrew is Abaddon, but in Greek, he is he has the name Apollyon. One woe is past, behold, still two more woes are coming after these. That's that is the fifth trumpet. The sixth trumpet. Enormous military destruction. And we, we are seeing terrible destruction now in the Middle East. And it's hard to comprehend what this trumpet is, is portraying. And it is in Revelation 9, 13 through 19. Then the sixth angel sounded, and I heard a voice from the four horns of the golden altar, which is before God, saying to the sixth angel, sixth angel who had the trumpet, release the four angels who are bound at the great river Euphrates. So the four angels who had been prepared for the hour and day and month and year were released to kill a third of mankind. The terrible destruction, military destruction that is described. Now the number of the army of the horsemen was 200 million. I heard the number of them. And thus I saw the horses in the vision. Those who sat on them had breastplates of fiery red, hyacinth blue, and sulfur yellow. And the heads of the horses were like the heads of lions, and out of their mouths came fire, smoke, and brimstone. By these three plagues, a third of mankind was killed by the fire and the smoke and the brimstone which came out of their mouths. For their power is in their mouth and in their tails. For their tails are like serpents having heads, and with them they do harm. They cause suffering to human beings. And then comes the, the, the last slide, please. The seventh trumpet. The seventh trumpet. Which is the seventh trumpet actually is broken down into the seven last plagues. And it says in Revelation 15, 1, then I saw another sign in heaven, great and marvelous, seven angels having seven last plagues, for in them the wrath of God is complete. And then it goes down Revelation uh, 16, jumping to Revelation 16. And it starts to describe, in, in verse 1 it says, that there were seven angels that now we're going to be uh, released, which is the wrath of God. This will be God's anger. You know, I want to follow up and I, I want to really emphasize something, even though I'm telling you some very heavy things that are very hard for us to truly comprehend. I, 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 want, I want to go back to address that. That issue. The first plague one of the seven last plagues soars on beast worshippers. Soars on beast worshippers. That's described in Revelation 16 2. It says, So the first went and poured out his bowl upon the earth, and a foul and loathsome sore came upon the men who had the mark of the beast and those who worshiped his image. Plague, the second plague of the seven last plagues. The oceans become blood totally. Revelation 16, 3. Then the second angel poured out his bowl on the sea, and it became blood as of a dead man, and every living creature in the sea died. The third of the seven last plagues. Rivers and fresh waters become blood. So now it's the rivers in fresh water. Then the third angel poured out his bowl on the rivers and springs of water, and they became blood. 
the fourth of the seven last plagues. The sun scorches the earth, Revelation 16 and 8. Then the fourth angel poured out his bowl on the sun, and power was given to him to scorch men with fire. Unprecedented. The fifth plague, thick darkness in the beast kingdom. It's interesting. In Egypt, in the plague at that time of ancient Israel, there was darkness in Egypt at that time. So just to parallel the uh, Revelation 16, 10. Then the fifth angel poured out his bowl on the throne of the beast, and his kingdom became full of darkness, and they gnawed their tongues because of the pain. It got so cold, it was painful in that darkness. And then the sixth plague, Euphrates River dried up. Revelation 16, 12. Then the sixth angel poured out his bowl on the great river Euphrates, and its water was dried up so that the way of the kings from the east might be prepared. So the armies that will exist in the east will now be enabled to go to where we have said for decades, ever since we've been in the church, way back, keep your eye on the Middle East and on Jerusalem because everything will eventually focus on Jerusalem. And why? Obviously, that's going to be where Christ is coming to rule the earth. And Satan is angry about that. And he's going to deceive the world to gather to battle in and around Jerusalem. And he's going to dry up the river Euphrates to enable the eastern huge armies to come and to be there in the Middle East. Plague 7, massive final destruction, Revelation 16, um, seven, 17 through 21. Then the seventh angel poured out his bowl in the air, and a loud voice came out of the temple of heaven from the throne, saying, It is done. And there were noises and thunderings and lightnings, and there was a great earthquake, such a mighty earthquake, and great earthquake as had not occurred since men were on the earth. Now the great city was divided into three parties, and, was, and the cities of the nations fell, and the great Babylon was remembered before God to give her the cup of the wine of the fierceness of his, God's realm. Then every island fled in the mountains and were not found. Great hail from heaven fell upon men. Each hailstone about the weight of a talent, men blasphemed, blasphemed God because of the plague of hail. Since that hail was exceeding great. Why is there so much suffering that you've seen? It's because sin will continue to increase in this earth. And that produces suffering that will occur in this earth. But right at the end of the seventh plague will be the gathering of the armies at Armageddon and then they're moving to Jerusalem to attack the returning Jesus Christ as his feet stand on the Mount of Olives, right next to Jerusalem. And brethren, even though I will keep this uh, uh, short, I really want to focus, even though I've gone through all this terrible, this, this terrible, sobering things with you, and all the increase of the sufferings until Christ returns. Our loving God knows all about this suffering, and he deeply cares about each and every person who has been suffering during uh, these times of the, the beginning of sorrows and into the coming seven 
trumpet holds. When Christ's feet finally touch down on the Mount of Olives, he will come not only as the conquering King of Kings and Lord of Lords, as it says in Revelation, he will also come as the Prince of Peace, as he's called in Isaiah, and as the Son of Righteousness with healing in his wings, which I read to you out of Malachi. But he will begin a spectacular period of worldwide healings of human beings, and he, and he will begin the alleviation of all suffering. It will begin when his feet step on, down on the Mount, Mount of Olives, and it will continue past this plague through the millennium and through the great white throne judgment because I think we can define resurrections with the great long judgment as the ultimate healing of many people uh, from their deaths. And those who died and were not healed at that time. Isaiah 33, 22 through 24. And if we could read a few scriptures, I just want to read to them through the point here. Starting with uh, verse 22 of Isaiah 33. For the Lord is our judge. The Lord is our lawgiver. The Lord is our king. He will save us. And the inhabitant will not say, I am sick. That seems to imply that there will be universal healing. The inhabitant will not say, I am sick. The people who dwell in it will be forgiven their iniquities. They'll be spiritually as well as physically healed. Isaiah 35, 3, 5, and 6. Strengthen the weak hands and make firm the feeble knees. Then the eyes of the blind will, shall be opened and the ears of the deaf shall be unstopped. Then the lame shall leap like a deer and the tongue of the dumb sing. For water shall burst forth in the wilderness and streams in the desert. Pure healing water will break out throughout the earth. Isaiah 50 in and Isaiah 58. Eight. Then your light shall break forth like the morning. Your healing shall spring forth speedily. He's talking to humanity. Your righteousness shall go. Well, actually, he's talking, uh, referring to Jesus Christ, the Messiah. Your righteousness shall go before you. The glory of the Lord shall be your rear guard. And it's actually talking about his ancient of Israel and of humanity. So, as I said, the huge number of spectacular miracles that Christ did that are recorded in the four Gospels are a are a is a, a minute foretaste of the, the, the spectacular worldwide healings that are going to be. But to answer, to make a statement right out of the sermonette that we heard this morning, to respond to what was said, uh, what the, the uh, slide that was shown during the sermonette. We are not there yet, right now. We are not in what I just described. We know that. If we humans had a device capable of accurately monitoring and measuring, quantitatively measuring on a worldwide basis, a human suffering or human misery index, like a Geiger counter counts for radioactivity at a location, is capable of counting the, the quantity of radioactivity. If we had such a device, we would undoubtedly know that suffering is increasing in this world. 
And, and you know, I went and looked on the internet. There actually is a human suffering index, and there's also something called the human misery index, but they're, they totally fall short of the real, of the true suffering going on, going on, which only God knows. Only God truly comprehends. But we know instinctively that there is increasing suffering. So I want to read two scriptures to you as near the concluding part of this message. So you, you, you know. I'm going to read to you, first of all, Matthew 10, 29-30. I'm going to read that, this, this section of scripture. It says, Christ said, Are not two sparrows sold for a copper coin? And not one of them falls to the ground apart from the Father's will. God keeps track of every sparrow and knows when a sparrow drops down to the ground. Yeah. But the very hairs of your head are all numbered. And that's not just the disciples. I believe that's the hair, the very head, hair count of every human being who has ever lived on the face of the sea. Whoever will live. Now, in the millennium, and the great life and judgment. That's the God we, who, it, who also, by the way, just in passing, has named all the stars. He's given, assigned a name. All the stars. And he knows every year of every one of us. He knows when uh, the count. And also, I want to read Psalm 56 8. And this is a Psalm of David. He says, You number my wanderings, put my tears into your bottle. Are they not in your book? Not only does God know every hair on the book, my hips. He knows every tear we have ever shed in our lives and every tear we yet shed in our lives and in the lives of those going on until Christ's return. And just to read it from the CE version of Psalm 56 8, you have kept record of my days of wandering. You have stored my tears in your bottle and counted each of them. If those two scriptures are true, and they are, because every verse in the Bible is absolute truth, then the Almighty God, who has also given a name, as I said, to every star in heaven, knows these things about each one of us, and he knows absolutely how much suffering every human being, past, present, and future, until Christ's return, has gone through. And he monitors them, and he cares about them. And he longs for the time, the right time when the Father gives, gives the go-ahead for him to come and make all things new as King of Kings and Lord of Lords. As we observe the Feast of Trumpets, God is revealing a roadmap to us. And the first part of it is tough. It's tough to comprehend. But never must we forget the last phrase in the last verse of the book of Matthew. We must never, no matter what happens, no matter what we see going forward, never forget. We must never lose sight of Matthew 28 and 20. The last phrase, lo, behold, I am with you always, even to the end of this age. Amen. Amen. So, God, 
will be with us until the end of this age. He knows what is going to happen in, in his plan right before his return. But he has a great plan. So by celebrating the Feast of Trumpets, we, first fruits in the church, are declaring that we are looking forward to Christ's return to the earth, which will mark that turning point in human history, the transformation of humanity from sin-caused suffering and satanic deception to healing and salvation. And in conclusion, as Paul said near, near the end of his life, finally there is laid up for me the crown of righteousness, which the Lord, the righteous judge, will give to me on that day, that day of trumpets. Not, I'm not saying it's going to be on, although it may be on a literal day of trumpets, but it will be what is being fulfilled by the day of trumpets. On that day, and not to me only, but also all who have loved his appearing by keeping the Feast of Trumpets, all of us, you and I, are declaring that we love Jesus Christ supreme. Jesus Christ is quoted in Matthew 20, uh, not Matthew, in Revelation 22, 20, the last, near the end of the book of Revelation. It says, he who testifies of these things, in other words, Jesus Christ says, surely I am coming to Amen. Even so, come Lord Jesus. So as we live in this age, dealing with the suffering around us, in our lives and in the lives of the world, and our brethren and the members of the world, let us never lose sight of that wonderful climax in this picture by this day, the second coming of the Messiah, Jesus Christ.